Welcome to our series on St. Matthew's Gospel. I want to continue sharing with you from Matthew chapter 9. Uh, we're in the middle of Jesus' miracle ministry and he has worked his second set of three miracles, the calming of the storm, uh, the demons at uh, Gadara and the cure of the paralytic. And after this, Matthew gives you a second buffer set of texts. The first time uh, he gave us a, a buffer set, it was about the difficulty of being a disciple and the cost of being a disciple. And this time it is the joy of discipleship. Immediately we are given the very decisive call of Matthew and his response to us. Now I introduced this the last time, but I just want to give it to you in detail. And this event shows the joy that Jesus' forgiveness and acceptance uh, brings into people's lives. And that Jesus' mercy is actually inaugurating a new age of redemption for the world. The setting we have here uh, immediately after Matthew's call is that of the Messianic banquet. I want to read it for you. While he was at dinner in the house, it happened that a number of tax collectors and sinners came to sit at the table with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your master, not our master, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, he's keeping bad company. But when he heard this, he answered, Jesus did not leave the answer to the disciples, he answered himself. He said, it's not the healthy that need the doctor, but the sick. Go and learn the meaning of these words. What I want is mercy and not sacrifice. And indeed, I did not come to call the virtuous. That's quite some answer for the scribes and Pharisees. They wouldn't take that very nicely. But let's put it in the setting that Matthew wants you to hear. And that is the Jewish people called the kingdom of God a messianic banquet. Uh, and that you would join God's banquet in heaven. Uh, and Matthew brings it in here, and he's going to give it to us in greater detail in chapter 22, the call to the Messianic banquet. Um, and it's the place where the people who have repented, and now they are the called and the chosen, uh, come and take their places in the kingdom of God. Of course, there are other people present who are not called or chosen, not because God didn't do it, but because they won't accept it. And so they turn up as the, the people who insert themselves into the situation all the time. And this was going to be a phenomenon that would happen in every century of the, the church's life. And that is that there would be people present in the church, not there as the disciples, but there to create trouble. And so the scribes object to what Jesus is doing on doctrinal basis, which is what they do throughout the gospel. The Pharisees object on the grounds of Jesus' behavior, which is what they do throughout the gospel, because the Pharisees presented themselves as the perfect ones. That's what they were called, that they were the ones who kept the law absolutely perfectly. Jesus had the very uncomfortable job of telling them not only were they not perfect, but it was the exact opposite. And so he's going to begin here very gently. Once we go into chapter 15, he really uh, pulls back the veil on what they're actually like. And in chapter 23, he gives the most dreadful indictment of the scribes and Pharisees, which actually guaranteed his death. They, they wouldn't take that at all. But there's an amazing group here. And that is, we expect the scribes and Pharisees they always get there, uh, somebody has told them what's going on. So they manage to, to be at anything Jesus is at because they're watching him all the time. They're trying to trip him up both doctrinally uh, and to find out something wrong in his life. And therefore they want to condemn him because they've decided at a much early stage that they want to condemn him. But the surprising group that's here are John the Baptist's disciples. At this particular stage, John the Baptist is already in prison 
Now, Matthew doesn't give you that detail. Uh, you just have to know that John the Baptist's disciples are loose and they've nobody to follow, so, so they, they would naturally go to Jesus. Now, it's the other synoptic gospels will tell you that John the Baptist is in prison and therefore John wants his disciples to go to Jesus. Come and see. But John was an ascetic and prayer and fasting and a very severe way of living uh, was normal for him and he trained his disciples in the same way. So they don't understand Jesus going to a banquet. They don't understand the, the fancy eating, if I can put it that way. Uh, they also don't understand why Jesus won't be asking his disciples to fast. So they say it to him. John's disciples came to him and they said, why is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't? In other words, you don't seem to be doing the right thing. They're not doing the right thing. How could you possibly be the one that we're to follow? And this is an example of the superficial judgment that human beings make on each other. Now, if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount in chapter seven, we were told not to judge other people and not to try and take the splinter out of other people's eyes when there's a plank in our own, meaning that we don't actually see what's going on. We don't see what God is actually doing through this person or these set of circumstances. And so we rush to judgment and we're usually wrong. So Jesus replied, surely the bridegroom's attendants would never think of mourning because fasting was part of mourning as long as the bridegroom is with them. Now, this is an answer he gave to John's disciples who at least are properly motivated and are trying to do God's will. The others are simply trying to trip Jesus up. So he didn't tell them that. He told John's disciples that he was the bridegroom at the feast. Now, if you know your Bible, only the Lord, God, is the bridegroom and Israel is the bride. So Jesus is saying, the Lord God is in your midst and you should be rejoicing. You should be recognizing his presence because Matthew has told us from chapter one who Jesus is, that he's the son of God, he's Emmanuel, he's God with us, uh, he's the Davidic king and all the rest that he has told us. Um, and John's disciples, because they are people of prayer and fasting, they should have recognized this. They don't. All they see is you're eating and we're not. It's a, a very, very quick to judgment. So let's go back a small little bit. So these are the groups that are actually present. Matthew's gospel gives Matthew's call, which is only done in one sentence as the model for all others, that you just simply respond to the Lord's call with alacrity, you go quickly, you say yes quickly, okay. And the model that he has in his mind is Elijah and Elisha. Elijah challenged Elisha, Elisha got up, sacrificed and went and joined um, uh, Elijah. First of all, as his servant, then as his disciple, then as his friend and then as his continuator. And that is the process that Jesus is using with regard to his own disciples. And to follow the call with a fellowship meal was actually terribly important. Matthew was a man who had been, as I said before, a Levi in the temple and he had lost his way and so on. He used very simple logic on Jesus. You know who I am. You know the state I found myself in. You know the way of life I had. If you're willing to accept me, I can introduce you to lots more like me. And so he puts on a banquet in which Jesus can meet all the others. It's very interesting here. The emphasis is on tax collectors. And then we're told, and other sinners. Now, when you're reading the Gospels, we usually presume that tax collectors and prostitutes are, are stuck together as the public sinners. But it seems that at this banquet, it's only men. The women are not actually there. So a sinner, uh, according to the Jewish thinking at the time, was a Jewish person who was not keeping the law. In other words, he was lapsed. 
so there's a, a group of men actually involved whose title as sinner we don't actually know. So it's a sinner's party. And because it's a sinner's party, the Pharisees who keep the law perfectly wouldn't dream of sitting beside them. And they're the ones presenting themselves as the, the holy ones, the separate ones, the ones who keep the law, the model for everybody else. And Jesus, who just only happens to be God-made man, does not despise any of his creatures, ever. And just by Jesus sitting with them, Jesus shows the scribes and Pharisees how wrong they are about religion. How absolutely wrong they are about religion. Religion is about loving God and loving your neighbor. That's what it's about. That's the essence of the thing. And Jesus will take that up with them as a, an argument in chapter 22 when they're challenging him. The Pharisees have re utterly rejected sinners. They're outside. They, they, you don't have to show any mercy or kindness or love or service or anything to them. But just by being present, Jesus is doing an enormous amount of things. Apart from telling them that you will find a doctor among the sick, where would you expect to find a doctor? He's not going to live among the healthy, is he? He'd have no job. Where would you find a teacher except among children who need to be taught? And so Jesus said, you need to look at this from a completely different angle altogether. But they could not accept something which is very wonderful. And I want to give it to you as clearly as I can. Jesus accepts the unacceptable. He forgives the unforgivable. He heals the unhealable. He loves the unlovable and he redeems the unredeemable. God is as different from us as the heavens are from the earth. That's what Isaiah said in chapter 55, verses four to nine. My ways are not your ways. My ways are as different from your ways as the heavens are from the earth. And here's the scribes and Pharisees thinking they represent God and religion and the word of God. And Jesus said, no, you're not representing anything. You're not representing the way God acts. In fact, as Jesus sat there uh, with this group, um, a text, a, a very wonderful text in Isaiah was fulfilled. It's Isaiah 35. Um, and Isaiah 35 is the gospel ahead of time. And this is what he says. I have to do this because otherwise you don't understand what Jesus is doing. Uh, Isaiah said, let the wilderness and the dry lands exult. Let the wasteland rejoice and bloom. Let it bring forth flowers like the jonquil. Let it rejoice and sing for joy. And you have to say, what is he talking about? You have to understand he's speaking in metaphors and he's saying, the wilderness is a person's life where the flowers of virtue are not growing. These people are at the table with Jesus. The dry lands are the people who do not have the living waters of grace flowing through them. They're sitting at the table with Jesus. And the wasteland are the people who have wasted their lives. They too are sitting at the table with Jesus. And Isaiah, the scribes and Pharisees should have known this. They were teaching scripture particularly the scribes. Uh, Isaiah said, these people who are the write-offs from society, that they are the very ones that the Lord will gather around him. And he will say, I am going to bring forth flowers like the jonquil. That was some fabulous flower in their land. In, in my country, that would be uh, roses or lilies. They're our favorite flowers. Uh, in other words, that your, your life is going to literally bloom and the glory of Lebanon is bestowed on it and the, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. Now, he's talking about the Fertile Crescent uh, in the Middle East. And the, the extraordinary thing is you've got patches of real desert and then you've got this uh, 
fertile crescent where everything just blooms. And so these people are like the desert. And the Lord is saying through Isaiah, you're going to become like the fertile crescent. And they all say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where, where do you think you're going? And he said, strengthen all weary hands and steady all trembling knees and say to the faint hearts, courage, do not be afraid. Your God is coming. That's why the desert is going to bloom. That's why the wasteland is going to have uh, living water going through it. Your God is coming. Vengeance is coming. The retribution of God, he's coming to save you. Now, supposing I have all of these people uh, sitting in front of me, they'd say, ah, yes, but look at the fine print, the retribution and uh, the vengeance. That's what he's going to do. And Isaiah said, no, he's coming to save you. And he's going to fight the demons who are destroying you. He's going to fight sin that's destroying you. He's going to fight illness that's destroying you. He'll fight with anything that destroys you. He wants to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unsealed and the mouths of the dumb will sing for joy. What we've already met in some of the miracles. These are the Isaiah signs that God would be in their midst. And Jesus has already produced these signs and the scribes and Pharisees cannot see. That is blindness, either culpable or otherwise. They cannot hear God's word uh, being fulfilled. That's deafness, culpable or otherwise. And then this is the explanation of this fellowship meal that Jesus is having with these, these uh, public sinners. For water gushes from the desert streams from the wasteland, the scorched earth becomes a lake and the parched land springs of water. And my favorite one, the lairs where the jackals used to live have become thickets of reed and papyrus. Uh, I could translate that for you. When you go to the gospels, now this time I'm taking the four gospels, okay? Uh, water gushing from the desert is the extraordinary transformation of Mary of Magdala. She experienced a spiritual resurrection and became one of the greatest disciples of Jesus. Streams in the wasteland, Zacchaeus who fell out of a tree couldn't believe that someone like Jesus would pay him any attention. And if I cheated anyone, I would pay him back four times as much. The scorched earth, I always put the sinful woman there. Uh, and the, the parched lands, the leper. But my favorite one, the lairs where the jackals used to live have become thickets of reed and papyrus. Now reed and papyrus were used to write the word of God. That's Matthew, who had been living absolutely a wasted life. And here he becomes a source of the word of God. Hence his name, Matthew, a gift of God and through it will run a highway undefiled. This is the way of redemption going through the whole of human history, going all the way back to God. It will be called the sacred way and nothing unclean will be there. Nothing unclean means nothing unfit for the presence of God. In other words, only the redeemed will be on this path. And uh, I'll jump to the end of this. Only the redeemed will walk on this path and they will come to the Lord shouting for joy with everlasting joy on their faces, gladness and joy will be with them forever. This is what Matthew is saying about this crowd at this banquet, that this is the foretaste of, first of all, the banquet of the Eucharist, and secondly, the Messianic banquet in eternity. That if the Lord has come into this place, he cleanses, he heals, he purifies, he redeems, he sanctifies, and then he glorifies. The poor scribes and Pharisees, you'd, you'd be sorry for them for missing absolutely everything. And they miss everything simply because of their own prejudice. They also don't seem to realize that this meal uh, mirrors uh, the banquet in the Song of Songs, chapter two and verse four. He has brought me into his banqueting table and the banner over me is love. Now, love means uh, God's loving mercy. And of course, that's exactly what you have here uh, with Jesus, the bridegroom, among the people who will become part of his bride, the church. 
Uh, at the moment, they don't look awfully promising, but uh, most of those uh, people present became disciples of Jesus. Um, so the Pharisees looking in at this completely blind, just simply say he's keeping bad company, which is totally amazing. Um, but Jesus said, don't you realize that right in the very heart of the, the scriptures, you read what I want is mercy, not sacrifice. And to show that, I'm going to give you the reference of Psalm 40, verses six to nine, Psalm 50, and also Psalm 51, verse 17, which says, Lord, my sacrifice is a broken spirit. Okay, and Matthew's going to take up this theme uh, as we go on into chapter 12 as well. And not only that, but since the scribes and Pharisees are the teachers, they should have known because they quote uh, other rabbis that since the time of the exile, the rabbis had taught the people that works of mercy brought forgiveness from sin. And if Jesus is doing nothing else, He's doing a work of mercy, okay? But what they don't grasp at all, and they will refuse to grasp it, is that Jesus is the mercy of God incarnate, reaching out, healing, transforming, and that his mercy is infinitely greater than their 613 rules of a ritual purity, whether a person was right or not interiorly. And Jesus is looking for the interior uh, uh, condition of the human person. So Jesus came on earth specifically to invite unredeemed people to come and join him and he would do the healing, the forgiving, the transforming and everything else that needed to be done. He said, I didn't call the virtuous. That's very sad, extremely sad. The so-called virtuous are the scribes and Pharisees. And the reason why he says, I didn't call you, is that they presume they've already passed the test. And they, they're, they're not even within a shouting distance of it. It's really frightening. He said, I didn't call you. They, they fit the elder brothers of the, the parable of the elder and the younger brother, which is only in Luke's gospel. Matthew doesn't pick that up. He just simply illustrates the elder, what I call the elder brother syndrome. Um, and these who are the elder brothers of uh, Israel will be opposing Jesus' mission the whole way through, whole way through. Uh, and Jesus will warn them. Uh, and Matthew takes this up as a major theme in his gospel. Jesus warns them that if they keep opposing him, he's the presence of God, he's the word of God incarnate, he is the savior, there is no other savior. He was sent specifically to Israel, and if they absolutely reject him, they are in danger of hell fire. In case you think I got that wrong, you'll find it in chapter 8, chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 21, chapter 22, and chapter 23 of Matthew. So you'll be hearing this over and over again. And the warning is there for any of us in the church that if we think we've made it, and we think we can despise anybody else, that we get zero from the Lord. Because it's mercy he wants and love. So it's, it's very sad at this particular moment that John the Baptist's disciples are now locked in with the scribes and Pharisees. They, they get out of that company very quickly because John the Baptist had opposed the scribes and Pharisees if you go back to chapter three. And he told them they were a brood of vipers. So his disciples can't stay in that company. And there's only two companies here, Jesus and whatever he's doing, or the scribes and Pharisees and whatever they're doing. So they don't have a choice. They must actually go over to, um, to Jesus. And they have got to wake up and realize that Jesus has a greater vision than John. John was great. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. But Jesus is the Lord. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach live. Goodbye. God bless you. Each one of us is on a journey. 
Some of us are on the journey of growing up. Some of us are in education. Some of us are falling in love, going to work, struggling with unemployment or ill health. We all need to have the scriptures open to us. We all need to encounter Jesus on the road. I really warmly welcome the work of Shalom World Television. Thank you for the way in which you assist in the mission of the church, helping them to come to terms with the eternal truth as it applies in their lives, whatever their journey. And I extend my blessing to you and to all your viewers, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Shalom World, God's own channel.